of more people, guys. But it's just me and Duke right now. Uh, maybe more people will show up. Uh, but how's everybody? Before we get started, we're going to be kind of cutting down on the swearing a little bit. Okay, a lot. And we're going to start having kind of themes for it, and it will kind of be up in the air what it will be from week to week. This week is kind of historical reenacting, uh, like where to go, get the stuff you need, you know, where you can get the stuff supplies to make it, stuff like that. Uh Uh, because I've had some questions, I've got them. Asked. I got pull that questionnaire up that I made. Uh, well, I should say it's more of a note thing for me. Of uh, stuff. Where is it? Where did I hide that word pad? Dang it! Here it is. There it is. Okay. It's having an update. Good. How? Why? Why in the world would a memo pad need to update? Oh, I suppose it's because it's time for it to update. Yeah. Well, until then, we kind of got questions. Hey, Wild Western Pete, how are you? Uh, when we get everything, when's my? Up oh, there it goes. Okay. Um, pull up that file. Uh, son of a bitch. There we go. Did you just stab yourself with a needle? No. I just, uh, my uh, exacto knife just ran across my pattern outside of the mark. Mm. In the wrong direction. Yeah. And you almost have to, it, it depends on how bad it is, you might have to restart. Well, considering this is a uh, Mexican flap holster, it uses a lot of leather. I don't want to do that, so I made it work. Okay. But I lost about a quarter inch in that one spot. Mm. The thing about new blades is they're so sharp that they don't want to stay in the lines, but the thing of it is, when they get to be dull blades, they have the same problem. Uh, Wild West Pete asks, what, uh, what are Wild Western PF. What are you two talking about this evening? Kind of historical reenacting, kind of starting out where you can find some stuff. And I'm still learning all this stuff. And that's why I was hoping to have at least a couple of people on here besides Duke who do this, but they all have uh, not decided not to show up. So we're stuck with Duke and all his vast knowledge of knowledgeness and i don't know a whole lot i just kind of make believe like i do unless uh, one, there's not as much lag on this as there is with that the old hangout system because the old hangout system i'd be talking over people because i didn't know they was talking oh yeah same here and it made me feel so bad it it did it it, it, it oh it made me feel like shit. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and I hope you don't mind. Let's get to the first question. What is a good pair of modern made boots that's on the cheap that you can kind of get today to pass off for a, quite a few time periods? This was... There's a company out there, and they take a long time to get because uh, they're all custom made. It's called Missouri Boot and Shoe, and you probably better going off with uh, the Brogans. The Brogans would be good from 1840s on up to mid 1880s, I would think. And uh, they're gonna run you two hundred dollars a pair, almost three. Um, 
<clears throat> so not exactly cheap, but they are top of the line. Yeah. Uh, and that's, I could actually, if I had the 12 hour drive, Oh yeah, uh, Warsaw told uh, apparently. Hey, Santee. Um, shoot, we need Santee on here. Hey, Santee, can you forward him the message? Because he's very knowledgeable. If that's if yeah, you're he knows, on Santee, uh, yeah, he knows, he knows a lot. lot. Stuff. Yeah, he's been actually been helping me out a lot. With some of the questions I've had, and I want to. If y'all, any of y'all are not subscribed to Arizona Ghost Riders, y'all need to. That he is a wealth of knowledge, and he he does. I wish I could do the video quality stuff he does. Uh, but yeah, there's an. I think it's the Remington 1875. It's a CO2 BB pallet pistol. Uh, that's fine, uh, Santi. You can just watch, and if we make a mistake, you can correct us. How about them apples? Or if you have something to put on there. Because, like... I guess the reason he's sitting back and watching is because he doesn't have pants on right now. I have swim trunks on. But it's also been like a hundred and something today. So even with yeah. the air conditioner at full freaking blast, it's been hot in my house. Y'all are actually lucky I have a shirt on. We're finally starting to break out of our hundred degree weather here. Tell you what, when it hits a hundred and some, air conditioner don't work all that well. Uh, yeah, we can see you, Santi. We can see you in the chat. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but, oh, yeah, next question. Let's get, let's, I wrote these down just so I wouldn't forget them. Because I have about a, barely a better mind than Duke sometimes about this stuff. Uh, what would be a good rifle pistol combination to, for about the end of the Civil War to almost the time of the Indian War? Um, any black powder pistol, cap and ball pistol would work up into the Indian Wars, the early Indian Wars. Um, um, any conversions? Uh, maybe... If you were playing a new guy, person is supposed to be a Yank, maybe a Remington, because uh, a lot of they were made a lot there. They were prevalent in the Civil War, and if I'm not mistaken, that weren't they just sold as surplus? Yeah, so you could play anybody and have a Remington. Yeah. Uh, then you also got the Colt Navy. The 51 Colts, I think they were used a bunch, weren't they? And then they the Navy, the 61 Navy didn't see a lot of production. Um, the 1860 Army. Yeah. Um, the Richards Mason conversions of those guns. Yeah. Uh, so there, there's a wide variety of what you can get, and sometimes you can find – You find them pretty cheap. I gotta turn my notification down because my microphone's all the way over here, and my phone's picking it. It's picking that up. Yeah, Arizona Ghost Rider said Henry and a Richards Mason that would work, or Winchester sixty six. Um, if you're doing later Indian Wars, like the eighteen seventy, about the time Custer got wiped out. Um, Warsaw says he'd go with a Colt Dragoon. That would be a decent choice too. Yeah. Well, thank uh, you. You better be ready to pack some iron because them are heavy. 
Yeah, uh, maybe you could get you a shark because near the end, a lot of them were uh, paper cutters as they become to be nicknamed. Like this one here, there were some that had the brass cartridges. Um, nice thing about a sharps is it's pretty easy to convert from a paper cutter to a brass gun. Oh yeah, literally, literally, all you have to do is take this down, drop the lever, rem remove this, put your news in there, new uh, new breech in there, breech block in there, put that pin back in there. Let the hammer down. That is it. Well, you'd have to sleeve the barrel and oh. change it. But yeah, a, a gunsmith could take and he could make a um, a decent gunsmith could make a firing pin for that gun. Yeah, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there uh, the first ones were M5460, the brass cartridges. No. Uh, 5070. 5070? Yeah. Uh, Spencer is a 56.50, but they did do the funky. It's actually a 50 caliber bullet under 56 grains of black powder, but um, Spencer did things backwards. Um, then you got the 5656, which them never really, they never made a lot of them. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, he's, I don't think, I don't think he, the person was talking about being a soldier. I was thinking about maybe a buffalo boar hunt, you know, a buffalo hunter or something like that. Uh, or plainsman. And, you know, well, even a surplus paper cartridge uh, would be a good choice. That's why I had the sharps there. I wonder if that question was coming up. Stay. Uh, well, we got a question on side chat real quick. What was that pertains to cap and ball questions with the cap and ball. I got a brass frame. What do you guys use for load grain? Uh, grain, I guess he's talking about like, what would we prefer to load it with if we had one? Cause I've never had a brass frame. Um, load them light. Uh, uh, Using a 44, put about 20 grains in it max. If it's a 36, you can do full. 15 uh, and depends too if it's one of those remington copies it'll they'll take a little bit more but i wouldn't want to push them too hard uh santee brought up a good you know good thing uh i'm gonna show that henry and richard mason that would get you probably up until probably Turn of the century. Uh, Henry, no, no, Henry be burned out by the eighteen eighties. I'm talking about the. I'm talking about for the the Richard Masons. You know, there's someone's going. Oh yeah, yeah, and uh, seventy two open top would be. Um, well, the thing is about some of those Richard Masons is they were uh, rimfire. They were converted to shoot rimfire, so. They may not work. Yeah. But I'm just saying, you know, if you had to reenact, you could probably. Depends on what era they were, you know. If you say you're playing a cowboy and you had a. Uh, or a cow puncher, they didn't get to make a lot of money. Yeah, so, that's what we're going to go with a 72 open top then. Yeah. But if you're playing some prob someone in the military, you'd probably want to go with. A sharps, not a sharps, um, trapdoor and a, a Colt. And there's a lot of companies up that makes Colt, uh, Peacemaker copies. Um, if you're going to portray somebody in the military, you've got to go with the very strict lines of what you have and what you use. It's just yeah. not in your, your favorite military like gun and. Hope that works. No, that when you get into doing that military stuff, them guys are sticklers for everybody being the same and everybody being accurate. Yeah. Uh, 
Warsaw, have you seen, uh, asked if I had seen my, his new video? No, I have not, Warsaw. Uh, I have not, I've been busy, busy, but you gotta understand, I don't get to watch videos until Friday, Saturday, and the heck happened to mine, the only one in the chat now? There we go. I'm back now. Well, I thought, holy crap, did that become my chat all of a sudden? It. I don't know what's going on with this computer. I've just updated everything. Oh, yeah. We for completely forgot about the Spencer. Yeah. And uh, I've not fired a Spencer. Uh, I got a buddy that's got a Spencer. He's going to let me shoot one of these days. Um, it just depends on when him and I can get together and get the same spot at the same time. Yeah, I haven't either. I've won it. I've seen one at the range. But I just didn't do it. I'm wondering why the Spencer was never adopted militarily. It was. It well, was I military. Oh, no, I'm talking about like a full blade. Uh, that's the standard rifle. What is the standard? Rifle for the cavalry in uh, some places in the Civil War. Yeah, I don't talk about like the Civil War. There was a lot of stuff that could be standard. There, you got a little bit of room to wiggle with, but you got to remember whatever unit you're joining. If you're doing Civil War reenactments, whatever unit you join, um, they're going to have their thing. So if you want to do use a Spencer, you're going to have to look for a unit that primarily <coughs> had Spencers historically. Yeah. Oh, I was talking about for, like, the infantry and stuff like that. Why wasn't it? Uh, oh, there was some you know. to the infantry that had it, too. Was there? Not common, yeah. Most of the ones I've seen are, are uh, caval uh, yeah, mounted cavalry. Cavalry, cavalry, however you pronounce it. Uh I forget who what uh, unit it was, but there was a unit here in Colorado that got nailed by the Cheyenne um, just shortly after the Civil War uh, at a place called Beecher Island. And uh, they all had Spencers. The big thing with the Spencer is to carry the ammo, they had to carry them Blakesley boxes, and them could be a pain in the butt to carry. That's yeah. why military adopted the trap door because you could just stick the ammo on a belt and it was a lot simpler. Uh, I'm, uh, Santee says, I think the Spencer is a light, is a lighter rifle than the Sharps. I, maybe, I think, I'm not sure. I don't know. I've never weighed a Spencer and I don't, can't remember the Sharps. Um, Spencer carbine and a Sharps carbine are about the same. The Spencer winds up a little bit more weight in the butt because all that ammo that goes up the tube. Um, but basically, a, a Spencer is a repeating version of a Sharps rifle. Yeah. That it, is essentially what it is. It's the baby of a Henry and a Sharps. And, uh, in fact, there are multiple parts on a Spencer that will fit on a Sharps. I think you use the same hammer, the same lever, and I think the trigger is the same. Hey, Pat Pondum. Yeah. Um, Spencer, can't remember his first name, he basically took the sharp rifle and says, okay, I'm going to make it a repeater. And that's what he did. And what, well, what, from what I've seen of it, even if you run out of that tube fed magazine, uh, tube fed buttstock magazine, I think is the correct way to say it. You can still single feed the chart, uh, the Spencer. Well, it's a rear action tubular magazine, whereas a Henry's a uh, front action tubular. Yeah. 
but I'm gonna after it. You spent the say this was a say it was for because I don't have one. I don't have one. You run out of here. It looks like you could drop it just enough to get that shell in there. Close it up and it locked the extractor in there and fire it and then it would extract it. But it looks like it has to come so far forward to get that extractor working. Well, uh, you mean the lever system? Yeah. It's not to to get the the, sh the extractor. It's to pick up that gel on the next round to get it up in there. Okay. Now, an 1887 shotgun. That's it. Throws it out for the extractor to pull the gel out. Uh yeah, it doesn't. Hey, Pundam, how you doing? We're talking about historical stuff. Ah, uh, get my little pad up there. What was a lot of the shirts made at? What kind of material was it? Y'all brought it up in a previous live stream. What was a lot of the shirts made out of? Flower sacks, if I'm not mistaken, wherever they were made of at the time. Cotton, muslin. Um, well, I think a lot of that stuff, you're just going to have to do your research. Um, you have to pick up a book and read a book. Um, or there's a YouTube channel on here called the 11th, 11th Ohio Volunteer Calvary, I think is what it is. Um them guys got a lot of over there on clothing. Uh, but your shirt, you know, you're going to have a cotton shirt or muslin shirt. Um, your uniform. And there's different grades of wool. You want to make sure you get the really good stuff because if you get the cheap stuff within a year and a half, it's going to be faded out in a funky color and they're all going to make fun of you. What? Uh, apparently, Pat Pundum fell, started off his truck by falling out of his bed because of the joke he made, uh, Santee made. Hey, Meg. Bye, Meg. But, now, y'all don't laugh. This is, like, the, literally the oldest lever action that I've got and the only lever action i got. Yeah, but yeah, this this was my John Wayne gun until I broke the stock. And it still kind of works. It throws the BBs out there, but I have to drop it down the tube, the barrel now, and then cock it. It no longer tube beads. My dog was knocked it out of the closet and. Uh, So now it's just a fun gun. Knocking over, scaring the crap out of uh, things again to my garbage cans at night. Uh, okay, now this one's a big one. And it's a three parter. What kind of not. Oh, he's. I'll wait for him to get back. Now, doesn't that, like. Use the sh uh, rim of the next shotgun shell to help ex throw it out after it's been extracted. Yeah, it won't throw the last shell fired. It won't throw it all the way out because it needs that next shell in line to give it that little extra push. And it doesn't work. But bigger beans, you playing with a lever gun. I get a lever gun. Yeah. Well, I, like I said, the only reason I was letting my dogs out and they knocked it over, and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to show this off. Okay, what kind of knives were commonly carried? Were they fixed blade, uh, simple folders? Uh, and what can you get to accurately represent one? Ooh, I'm trying to think. Uh, Barlow knife, you can find them cheap Pakistan copies of the Barlow. That would be decent. I've got one. Um, I think I took it to work and left it there because I couldn't find it the other day um barlow would be a good one 
Uh, you're going to do a fixed blade knife. I mean, anything mass produced by that point, individual hand forged blades are getting pretty rare. Wasn't, uh, yeah, uh, Santee says Bowie and Skinner. Uh, wasn't there also one that was uh, the Green River knife, wasn't it called, or something like that? Yeah, Green yeah. River uh, for fixed blades. Uh, he also said cowboys and miners carry folders. Oh, okay. I've been looking for that. I've been looking for that. Thank you. Everybody. Mama Murphy. I've been looking for these. I gotta make some more paper cartridges so I can make a video. Uh, <laughs> been looking everywhere for them, and she found them. Uh, Green River Butcher. Uh, I think weren't they? Made, I think those were used for a lot of trade and stuff too. Well, later on, yes, 1840s. You're better off with a Sheffield. I don't have my. Yeah, I do have my Sheffield. Um. Yeah, I got my Green River here somewhere. Oh, uh, where did I put it? Uh, oh, okay. Oh, uh, I, I was going to get to it in a second, Warsaw. Um, I, I love having Santee on the side chat. What? Mainly stuff like this. Yeah, Pat Pundum says this. Um, hold on. Oh, must be the, just me again. Um, so on the knife thing, I've got a few knives here. Um, Santee mentioned the Green River Butcher. That's what this is. Uh, the Butcher does have a little hump back here. I flattened that off because it uh, what didn't make it for a good utility knife. You couldn't, if you needed to poke a hole in something like a, a skin or a buffalo hide or something, that uh, hump back there go in. So I filed that flat. So that's a Green River Butcher that modified. This is also a Green River Butcher that's been modified. Same thing. Um, once I took one hump off, I decided to take it off the other one too. And then uh, this is my newest one. This is actually a copy. Um, that not, well, I don't know if you really call it a copy because the company has been in business for since the 1840s. Um, this is a Sheffield scalper. And I doubt you're going to be able to read that. Maybe you will be able to. Um, uh, but, uh, um, it's uh, J. Uh, Noel. J. Noel and Son Sheffield. So that one is, I've seen a few originals that are stamped just like that one. The only thing is, is that the originals were a five pin and the new ones are four pins. So okay. now show it now show it off. All right. Show it a little bit now. And uh if you're gonna order one of these, you gotta order them from England. And if you're gonna do that, you need to order probably a dozen of them, uh, because it makes the shipping really cheap. I paid 40 bucks for this knife. 
when it was all said and done. Now, uh, I can kind of get away with this one because from 20 yards, it looks just like a buoy in the sheath as long as I don't pull it out or they get closer than 20 yards. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I can. With a sander, you could fix that. Uh, yeah, I, I gotta. I'd have to fix, take all this off right here, which I was planning on doing anyway. Yeah. Uh. But now the main problem is the fact that the company logo is, and it I, it was used. My mother used it to cut potatoes. So. Is that a Winchester. Uh, Mazi Oak. Oh yeah. Hey, it it works. This is the sheath I made for it. When this is a rawhide sheath and it does have a welt in it. Um, but the thing about rawhide is, as soon as I sweat in it, you know, it goes back to being wet again. And it kind of conforms to your body. So the way I got that carried, it, it really conformed to my back. And this is where it curves around from my butt. Because when I carry mine, I carry mine right in the middle of my back on the back end. That way it don't get caught on anything. Yeah. Uh, Santee, right now I have to get a belt grinder. I just don't have one. Uh, and you said I needed some knives. Why? I got something a little bit better than a knife. Oh, what did I just get on my holster? Okay, now... Hello, Blue Healer 269. We're talking about history and some stuff that you need for historical reenactment for some people that have been asking me about it. Raw Mewi and. Uh, okay. Excuse me. Okay, I'm trying to, sorry. Uh, I'll be okay. right uh, Well, so I was about to ask your question for you. Uh, cruise control, engage, coffee on tap, caffeine on tap. I've got coffee right here. Oh, I took me a nap. I slept a few hours longer than I thought I was going to. Uh, well, Warsaw asked you a question. You probably, you probably answered a few times, but... What's that? Uh, I'm going back to it, YouTube. The chat jumped. Uh, here, I'll, I'll show it. Um, yeah, Norinko is in China. There's two of them in China that make these lever actions. And the, uh, this one that I got is the one made for, uh, Century Arms International. So it comes out of Zhengzhou. So this is not the Norinko. Um, this is the other cheaper copy. This will only cost you 400 bucks at a gun store. And I've taken it out to the range and I've put in every type of shotgun round that I have, which is like six or seven different brands not had a problem the only thing is uh with the double lot buckshot number four buckshot um it wanted to stick a little bit but i never had a major problem it just it ran fine uh, uh really like the shotgun it's just it's got a lot of sharp spaces in it you gotta take it apart and kind of uh buff some things in it i've noticed from like even shooting triple out of buck out of even some modern guns it it, they want to stick just uh they want to hang up a little bit it's a uh santi the sword is a cavalry saber i think it's for sergeants and below i believe if i remember correctly i'd have to junior off or non uh non-commissioned officers yeah in, yeah nco sword uh and it's No, Pat. No one can be allergic to coffee. 
That's just, that's just, that's just, what? How could you be allergic to coffee? I I'm playing with you, Pat. I I'm, not, I'm, oh. I can't have any caffeine. I can't drink any caffeine at all. Yeah. I'm not supposed to have coffee, but I, I tell him, says, look, do you want, you, you don't want to poke that bear. I had to give up caffeine, and then I wound up giving up nicotine. Well, I haven't completely given up nicotine, but I've pretty much given it up. I've gone down to basically smoking my pipe and cigar. Uh, Pat Pundum asks, I wonder how that shotgun would handle brass hulls. Wasn't uh, it I'll find out. I was going to say, wasn't it made for brass and paper shotgun shells? Yeah, it is because the modern ones, the star crimp goes out. Actually, you take a three inch shell and you put a star crimp, and you get a two and three quarter inch. Um, but this one, I think they've, you know, they've been making them long enough now. They've pretty much got the uh, the cycling problem figured out. They've got them fixed. I had no problems with uh, no matter what ammo I was running out there at the range. Uh, Santee says, show us the progress on the holster, Duke. Which one? Apparently the one you're working on now. And anyone that says he doesn't work on his holsters, I've got video proof that he does. It's right there. He's working on one now. Actually, I'm kind of playing right now with something. God, I hate these new razor blades. They do not last and cut maybe two holsters per razor blade. Um, <clears throat> give me a second here. I'm trying to cut out a thing to do a test on. Um, so this one is my rendition. I call this in the photographer. It's a round nose, uh, very rounded. And I don't think there's hardly a square corner anywhere on this gun or this holster. Um, but this is a copy of a, from a photograph couple of photographs actually of a guy um the guy was a photographer in the 1800s and for for he doesn't look for like a photographer he looks like a you know frontiersman that's been out there since the trapper days but anyway um his holster was kind of this style and it was tooled so i'm going to try to do some tooling on this what i'm trying to do is um practice on my uh cuts so i cut out a little scrap piece here um so i can make my border line before I go in and start stamping. Yeah. Because uh, I'm going to start playing around with some tooling again. Oh, okay. I get what Pat Pun is saying. Pat, most likely what the problem is, is that you're drinking, you need to try decaffeinated coffee. Or I like to call it more water than coffee. Neutered coffee. Huh? Neutered coffee. Yeah. I, I drink it. My coffee fights me back. Pat says nice. I'm still, uh, Pat, I'm still, I've got your order all ready to ship and everything. I'm just waiting on the payment to get here. As soon as it gets here, it's out the same day it gets here, man. Uh, Trapper Paul said he sent me some uh, money for one of the hit for his holster. I haven't, I haven't got it yet, but I hope I get it soon because oh, I might wind up keeping that holster. That's a nice holster. Oh, no, no. It wasn't Pat. Yeah, it was Trapper. It wasn't Pat. Sorry, Pat. My bad. I'm thinking about just someone else. My bad. I knew it began with a P. But, yeah. Uh, now the next question. And this one is kind of why I wanted Santee on here or someone else that do, does this kind of stuff. Because I don't know if yours does it or not. For bar scenes, how do you portray women and gentlemen of the have, uh, ladies of the night? Uh Interacting with men during the day and bar scenes. 
<clears throat> well, I don't think they cared whether it was night and day uh, for what they were doing. Yeah. I don't partake in that because I have a girl. I don't, you know, so I don't. <laughs> I don't I mean, you don't go down to the truck stop and pick up a lot lizard? Nope. Uh, no, if I wanted to do that, dude, I could literally, I could literally put you on my phone. you on my phone probably. And, but anyway, there's literally, there's a truck stop not like a half, half mile away from me. But, uh, yeah, like, how were they, how would someone modern day people portray that kind of actions? Very carefully. Most of the, uh, <clears throat> what I've seen, most of them are dance hall girls. They, they, they do them as dance hall girls. They don't do them as women of the night. Well, I was... Trying to be, I wasn't trying to just blurt it out like Saint T did on that first one of those chats that y'all had on your channel. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to. I'm trying to talking about yeah. women's <sighs> habits. Yeah. What was it that he asked? Something about shaving or something? I don't remember. I can't even remember, but yeah, but all I know I, is it was within the first five minutes of the chat. <laughs> oh, that was, I know my arse was a little. I fell off my couch watching that because I had y'all on my TV and dropped my phone because I was commenting on my phone watching y'all on my TV. It was. It was. It was. I laughed. My arse off. My mother came out of her room like, what the, are you watching? I said, it's just them talking about historical. Uh, anyway. Yeah. You sure you are, Santi. Uh, I would, honestly, the way I would say it is just have them cut, you know, I haven't cut cards for a poke. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I do a Gus McCray because it had to happen a few times in history. My stuff. Okay, I'm skipping that one completely. Uh, Santi says a lot of them were portrayed in loose portraits. Portray a lot of them in loose clothes. Um, so basically, they could wear whatever women wear. To, some of these women wear today, and they'd be fine. Yeah, pretty much. I'm sorry. Some of this clothes that they wear nowadays. Shoot, that doesn't leave much to imagination. It's all free advertising. Yeah. Um, what kind of liquor were served back then? Like whiskey, bourbon, rye, gin, toast, lightning, wine, beer. Santee's got a video on that. Yeah, I know. I was gonna say, I think I've, I think I answered that person with it, but uh, but uh. Yeah, I think we've that one's already been answered. Oh. About what time did smokeless powder become prominent in the old west? Turn of the century. So the old west was in fact pretty well dead. <clears throat> in terms of you know <laughs> Indians and stuff. Yeah, there's still plenty uh, going on that was mean, nasty, and all that other stuff. You had uh, Tom Horn, 
causing problems at the turn of the century and you know, a lot of shit was still going on, but excuse me, yeah. stuff, stuff was going on. Well, a few swear words here and there, that's not going to hurt, but then just not as bad as we once were. Uh, Warsaw asked, were there any Polish gunslingers back in the, in the Old West? Maybe. I'd make a joke, but I'm not going to go there. Have we hit the past the 30 minute mark yet? Uh, but probably. Uh, let me see how long. Let me see if I can pull it up on YouTube. Oh, that's cool. I have to go to YouTube and it says your current live stream. R r nice. Hey, we have four likes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. I know there was a probably a few Irish. Uh, I think there was a few more Irish ones. There's probably, yeah, Irish, maybe a few Scottish that were born, that migrated. So, uh, is the whole idea that gunslinger is kind of a myth of more of a, you had yeah. gun battery, but you didn't have the stuff like Hollywood would have you believe. Yeah, there was very few shootists, I think was the term that they preferred. As In fact, the only one I can think of where it was two people that faced off. It was a very famous uh, Hickok and Tut fight. Uh, Santi says he's signing off. Well, good night. Uh, Santi, you can't leave yet. We're still talking about history. Yeah. Don't, you, yeah. You have to be, you're our fact checker. Uh, we can't be having fake news. Yeah, we don't want no fake news. Uh, he says, maybe we can do this again next Friday. I can join you. Santi, we do this every Friday night now. Uh, Michael, I don't know if you saw Michael's last video, but I don't think he's going to be able to be gone on for too much long, you know, for a while. Yeah, I didn't see anything. I know he posted some stuff on Facebook. I guess his dad's not doing well. Yeah, yeah, he posted a video up explaining what's been going on and everything, and uh, everyone, if keep Michael in your thoughts and prayers, please. Him and his dad. He says, "Okay, there was a gunfight in Deadwood with one fella, and two others in the street." Yeah, I, I don't. I'm not. Yeah, as I think, there's been more actual duels in Hollywood than there was a natural the old west you know but it's a cool idea that two people that you know got mad at each other they went out and it sure as shit didn't happen like you know where they stand face off and wait till the third strike of the clock at noon yeah you know they it was a Oh crap! He's pulling a gun. I better see if I can pull mine faster. Yeah, it was. It, it's a cool idea. It honestly, it, it's a very romantic, honorific thing. You know, making the these a lot of these people the good guy honor bound and the bad guy cheat, but the good guy's so much faster. He's, you know, well. Here, actually, here in Arkansas, technically, dueling is legal if you use swords. Wooden swords. They're still legal. Now, where in the, is the fun in a wooden sword? You can kill somebody with a wooden sword. I know. But Especially you can't with your head off. If you use ironwood, you could, because you can actually put blade. That's, you can, true. that's you very can, true. You can use ironwood to cut down oak. So I'm th I think it would lop off a head. Uh, leather wrapped handles. Or rawhide. That what? Uh, what a lot of the the people that would. 
Because once I well, while Ironwood is still green, it's easy to cut down with stone tools. But once it becomes hard, it is almost like iron. It almost has that strength of iron, but it's it's hard to explain. Ironwood, you almost got to cut with a laser after it dries. Yeah. Yeah, wooden swords hurt. That's why a lot of HEMA places don't use them no more or use he heavy padding. They'll, they can break easy if you're not careful. But shoot, what's the fun of using? But, okay, let's move on to the next question. Why in the world, now this is the way it was put, that's why, that's why I copied and pasted it here. Why in the world would they need those heavy clothing for the U.S. Army uh, clothing? Well, basically, let me put it to you in this way. Um, the wool clothing, it keep you warm in the wintertime. And if you sweat enough in them and you get a breeze, that wool will keep you cool too. Um, but the thing of it is, is that if it makes sense, the government usually doesn't do it. Uh, so yeah, it's and wool was more readily available in the north back then and cheaper. Cotton was out of the south in the Civil War. Um, usually, a lot of it comes down to cost effectiveness. Kind of while we kept the Springfield trap door while we had something a lot better and the Winchester lever uh, actions. Well, Winchester lever action at the time that the trap door come out was not really all that potent. The trap door was something that could reach out and touch someone at a long, longer distance. It was harder hitting. And it was the same caliber as the Sharps. And all they had to do for a lot of those is they just had to make a modification to an old musket, surplus musket. Yeah, well, I was talking about later on when the Winchester started doing, like, the big bore calibers. Oh. Yeah, like, then they, then they, uh, the Army still had the spring, the single-shot Springfield trap doors. Well, the Army at the time was still of the mindset that, you know, soldiers go through way too much ammo if they have the ability to shoot faster, so they wanted them to shoot at a steady... Uh, constant rate, so that they wouldn't run out of ammo, so on and so forth. And that's why they maintained them up until you start getting to the turn of the century. Then you get the 3040 Craig, and they use that down in, in uh, Cuba. Yeah. And then we basically steal the Mauser design and come up with the Ot 3 Springfield, which becomes the Ot 6 Springfield. And that serves up until World War II. And in some cases, it was in Vietnam, too. The Ot 3 Springfield was used um, in Vietnam as a sniper's gun for the early part of the war. The 30 out 6 is, that's, not, that's a man-stopping cartridge. Yeah. But during Vietnam, they... Uh, <clears throat> Some of them went over to 300 wind mag because a 300 wind mag could reach out to a thousand yards. And despite what you see in Hollywood, Vietnam's not all closed in jungle. A lot of it, there's a lot of open there. And, um, Carlos Hathcock, um, he was one of the famous snipers there. He sniped him at a long distance. In fact, he up until the war in Afghanistan, he held the record for the longest confirmed kill and what's funny is the way he got that longest confirmed kill is he took uh, the uh, scope off of his sniper rifle and he mounted it onto a 50 caliber Ma Deuce machine gun put it on slow fire setting and then he could sit there and he had it zeroed in to where he could touch out at a mile and he uh, sit there and picked off enemy soldiers at a mile out with that machine gun Not only was he an excellent sniper, he was also 
you know, basically a MacGyver, and he could figure out ways to make things work. Mm -hmm. I mean, Warsaw asked a pretty good question, and I'm not very well versed in the military tactics of the Revolutionary War, and I don't know how well you are. So we'll probably get this completely wrong. He says, uh, Jeremy, what about Booth? Did they change a lot after a lot of things after the Revolutionary War? A lot of soldiers lost their feet due to Green Gay and Frostbite. I believe they might have changed the type of leather, maybe the way they were made. Uh, but I'm not 100% sure because I know yeah. after a lot of it, a lot of what we used for the Revolutionary War was whatever the person could get. And uh, you got to remember, during the American Revolution, we didn't have a whole lot of money sitting around to buy soldiers' goods. It was ammunition comes first sort of deal. Um, and in the Civil War, you know, the Union Army, they are pretty well, they're fairly well supplied. The uh, Confederate Army, you know, they might have to go without shoes or socks, and they might be walking around barefoot um, because all it all comes down to that, you know, supply. What supplies do you have and what can the government afford at the time? And a, Sorry. No, go ahead, Jeremy. Riding a donkey because that's all you had. But them ribs whipped the Yankee butt pretty good, even with bad shoes. So that's because a lot of the Yanks at the time didn't know how to shoot. This is true. They weren't having. They were. Oh, it was. They were having to go. They were able to go to stores to buy their food, and you know, all year round, they didn't have to. There were some that could shoot, and they were usually given the sharpshooters class, but most of your average Confederate soldier had to hunt, fish, for to put food on the table a lot of the times. Yeah, they owned farms and stuff, but a lot of them had to hunt and fish. So they, had, they knew how to make every single shot count yeah that's because y'all had to fire a 15 rounds to hit us one time i'm playing with your warsaw i have i have family members that were on both sides of the conflict i still have family <laughs> If they would have uh, uh, um, valued the Civil War on victories based on how they did the Vietnam War, which was body count, the South won. Big time. Well, of course, the Yanks had more men to throw at the, than the South yeah. did, too. So, Yeah. Well, if Abraham Lincoln... See, if Lincoln would have been smart, if he had put forth the same percentage of the total population of the North compared to what the South was throwing in with drafts, he could have ended the war two years earlier than he did. He could have had the largest army that was ever amassed. Oh, Pat, you don't understand. A Murphy family reunion is the uh, Civil War. We have one's from the north and one's from the south and they don't we don't like each other too well but if i believe that what cost the the really what cost the confederates the civil war we just didn't push as hard we didn't have the tech we didn't have enough competent ranking officers uh, we had we had Lee you know but then Jefferson Davis would just put people of higher that he fancied into high ranking positions and you look at their military career and it's like why are you leading these all this number of people you suck 
the Civil War was lost the day that Stonewall Jackson died. Because mm. if they'd have had Jackson, Gettysburg would have turned out different. I have a feeling it would have been way different. And probably a lot higher body count. When I get after that fight, he wouldn't have surrendered. Yeah. But we got Lee, so. Oh, yeah. Next question. Let's. Because we're kind of going into old politics. <clears throat> Hold on one second. Uh, it's one of the... Not Warsaw, it's one of the, it's Don Gertz. He's a wealth of knowledge, knowledge as well. Uh, next question. Well, we've answered those three. Okay. Thank you, Warsaw. Uh, why wasn't the Sharps fully adopted during the Civil War by one side or the other, in your opinion? It was, a, according to what they say, it's a better design, stronger design, and more versatile than this trap door. That's what they said in their, well, trim black door. Well. In their opinion, I'm, I think it's more down to cost, really. Because I think all they had to make the trap doors, it was just they took a musket. It was like, what, maybe $12 for the conversion to put the conversion on that total. Yeah. And when they slept, then they get, it, you know, slept about 100 of those together, shipped it out the door to a regiment. True, they had almost enough sharps to the ones they kept. Happened, a lot of them were used. They could train new people on them. You know, it's not that hard to train somebody on a sharps. Yeah, Pat brings up another good point: gas and powder leakage at the breach. Uh, well, with, with the brass cartridge, uh, I don't think you'd lose a lot of, I think that would help a lot. Don't you, Duke? What's that? Uh, a brass cart, the brass cartridges helping with uh, gas and powder leakage at the breach. Yeah, the on the originals you had that problem, um, but on the... Uh, or on the sharps, the original, the, the, the paper cutter sharps, you had that problem. But when you get to the brass, that brass swells out and seals that chamber up. Yeah. Uh, well, mine's not that bad. But no, can, my uh, repercussions aren't. Well, uh, Mark Hubbs had some problems out of his. But his yeah. was that O-ring conversion thing. Mine was made before they started doing that. Well, he had his done... Um, because his that Garrett they were made a long time ago and they're damn good guns. Um, the cartridge ones they're hard to find. Um, but uh, he had to have his done with an O ring because that old sleeve just wouldn't. They basically tried copying the original and it just didn't work out. Um, my uh, I don't know how well I'm gonna be able to show it, but mine has that that sleeve as well. Uh, do this. Uh, hold on, let me get up. 
flashlight, you know, I'm gonna be able to see it better. Oh, that's the right my eyes, I can't see now. Uh, oh, there we go. Yeah, see, mine has that, uh, it's supposed to have that moving sleeve. Right. But it doesn't, that doesn't work. How I fix that is that as I put a little bit of a uh, black powder lube around between the breech block right here and this, and that moves forward just enough that it helps seal it off. <clears throat> and it, it does help a little bit. I mean, I can kind of have, I've made a mistake and put my hand right here because that's where I needed to balance it at and shot it. And it, I got a little bit of gas burn, but not as bad if I hadn't had that on there. If it had been a cartridge, I don't think I would have felt that at all. If you but, watch Forgotten Weapons had one of the first sharps, uh, the slant breach, like 1848 or 49. Um, yeah. They fired it, and that thing, with that slant breach, you know, the gas on top comes up into your face, the bottom goes down and hits your arm. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's main the one some of the main reasons why that happened. But at the same time, I I don't understand why they adopted the trap door style of uh, loading. Because if that shell gets stuck or something, you have to get a pocket knife in there after it. Well, the only reason they get stuck is because they was using copper. It wasn't the gun; it was the ammo at the time. I've seen. Some forty-five seventies get stuck now, uh, and in the modern reproductions, yeah, it's because they got really weak ejectors on originals. They'll flip them clean out of the gun. Well, I was talking about some originals too, to modern and, uh, but, but of course they're like on the hundredth um, round through it, so black powder fouling probably is the problem there. Yeah, and that's probably what. That was probably a factor back then, too. I mean, if you're shooting black powder loads out of something like that. I forget who it was, but somebody, I remember, did a test with uh, some copper-made cases, and they they do not work with a crap. Oh, yeah, I, I have a feeling. Copper is too soft. Yeah. And also, I probably... the. But yeah, that's that's probably why that answer that, that that question is. I think that answered that question is pretty well. All right, he says send him a link. So hold on one second, I might get kicked out of this again. So if I do, just keep everybody entertained, Duke. Okay. As this has happened a few times, I'm, you didn't. You had. You were able to get through here from Facebook, right? Yeah. Okay. So I'm still able to do that. I'll just have to. Uh, do you have any problems uh, doing that, by the way? What? Uh, uh, joining up? No, I just clicked on the link, and it took me right there. It just is okay. easy with the old system, so. Hey, Mo Murphy's here. Uh, we're talking about historical stuff. Uh, we kind of bounced all around talking about history and everything. 
and historical reenactment. Uh, speaking, I got a question about that. Uh, what is a good, what would be good material to make for mountain man rendezvous stuff? I already know the answer to this deer, deer uh, buckskin, which you can yeah. get, you can literally, if you, you're a hunter, you can go get you some, uh, your hunt license, deer tags, go hunt, tan it out. If you don't know how to tan, take it to somebody that does know how to, um, tan it out, boom, and then turn it into buckskin. Yeah, but you want brain tan. And if you can't, if you don't want to use brain tan, because brain tan is expensive if you want to buy it, uh, then your next best bet is German brain tan, which is not exactly brain tan, but it'll work. It'll get you through. Yeah, uh, I can't remember what me and my grandpa used. I, uh, mom, my mom would probably know. I think I can't remember if it was brain tan or German brain tan, but we used to tan ours. Uh, and then he would sell them like that, because uh, where we would sell, uh, he would sell his hides. It was either you dried them out, and you sell them as raw, or you tanned them yourself which allowed you to put a maker's mark on it. Uh, and then sold them for double the amount. Uh, Mama said buckskin, a lot of rabbit skin, or beaver hide does well. Yeah, but beaver's, beaver's expensive if you have to buy it. Yeah, beaver is your money in that time period anyway. You ain't making clothes out of your money. Yeah. Rabbit, I can probably see maybe things being made out of rabbits. No, not really. That's oh. what I portray is I portray a mountain man at, at work. So. Oh, is it? Yeah. Well, also, I'm at maybe like things to hold things in, like maybe like at the house, maybe you could probably keep some stuff like marble bag or something. Make it out of brain tan. Brain tan? Yeah, that's the most common thing that was around at the time. Because figure out there on the plains, you're, this is even more desolate than cowboy era. There's no trains. Everything's brought in by wagon take or by steamboat, depending on where you're at. Take three months for supplies to get in. You might only see a supply caravan once or twice a year so once every four or five months you get resupplied and you got to start learning to make your stuff like the indians do okay okay so you so she remembers that she doesn't want to get it all out uh my grandpa apparently made a, a, his own mixture when he tanned that worked it's probably not historically correct, but it'd probably work. The thing of it is, I've known some guys that acid tanned some deer skins one time, and they made clothes out of them. And the first day they sweated in them, they uh, peeled the skin off their legs. Yeah. Uh, so don't ever do the acid tan on something you intend to wear. Okay, he needs to connect it. Uh, Don, if you can hear us, you need to connect your mic and stuff. You got to approve it. I had to do that when right. I walked on up there at the top of the yeah, and There he is. There we are. Yeah, he is. Yeah, any problems? No, I came right on in. All right. Okay, so apparently I, I'm, I'm liking this. I'm liking this thing. Stranger. Are, are you using that new YouTube program or? No, it's uh, StreamYards. Okay. Then how do yep. you do it through YouTube? Uh, basically, you make an account with your the Gmail. Uh, and then you just, uh, I think it auto links to your channel or something, and then it allows to come up on. You start the broadcast. It's really simple. It's free, too. You know how I like free stuff. Uh, 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 a coyote would probably maybe some coyote stuff, but we 
we were talking about I had a whole bunch of people ask me some questions on MeWe and I figured I'd make a live stream out of it. And I figured, you know, we'd start having themes for the talks and stuff. You missed a whole bunch of good ones. But I understand you just got home. Yeah, I was over to Buddy's house. We uh I took the Holly off my 74 and we put an Edelbrock on it and had to do a little adjusting, got it right, and then I watched the movie with the kids. Uh, Pat, you don't, uh, you can, if you wanted to join, I just need your email or your Facebook stuff, because that's where I sent these two guys. There's, and it comes right on, right on, right on up. And... But now we were asking, talking about uh, some questions. Uh, one was about the Spencer Sharps. Uh, what two guns would work? I'm trying to let me back up. Uh, yeah, uh, what two guns would be good to last from the end of the Civil War up to about the time of the Indian and uh, war time? Uh, well, in your opinion, what would be somebody, you know, and this person is on a budget, so they said they'd also be reloading for them, too. Well, if you're going to do Civil War, the Henrys were issued in very limited quality quantities for the war. The Spencers were very common, and they would have lasted you all the way up to pretty much they started issuing the Springfields, the trap doors. Right. And uh, you can get that Oh, what is it? Is it a 5240, whatever, 5250, whatever they got? 5650. 5650. That's now that is the more correct cartridge. Right. But in, in Don Gertz's world, when I sit down at the reloading table, I only like to reload one cartridge, and that is 45 long cold. Because I don't have to buy any other bullets. I don't have to cast any other bullets. I don't got to have any other brass. <laughs> And I'm going to be honest with you. When you're actually behind the gun pulling the trigger, are you going to notice that few hundredths of an inch one way or the other? Not really, no. So if you got money to burn and it's a hobby and you like having 50 different cartridges, then you know what? There's there's nothing wrong with that. If you're a cheap guidewide like me, then I, I had a Spencer. And I had a lot of guns. I got rid of them all. I got a few back. I got rid of some more. And uh, I'm going to show you something. My wife just dug this out of our storage shed. I've been looking for it. But this is an amazing book. Hold on one second. I remember how to do this. Uh, solo layout. There we go. Fighting Men of the Civil War. And it breaks down the equipment. It gives you all kind of good information. And what I said last time about picking an impression or whatever is figure out what you want to do. Figure yeah. out what time period you want to do. Go down to the library. And this book will tell you everything you need to know about uniforms, equipment. This is all original equipment. That's all artifacts. And a lot of this stuff is from individual units. So you can, you can get the very basic reenactor starter kit. If I can get it in here, right? This is the entire reenactor starter kit right here. That's your 62 Springfield. A lot of guys like to use the uh, the British Enfields because they don't have the same little problems about ignition. And you can strip it down to raw metal. And for the most part, it's kind of hard to tell a difference at a, at, a, at a distance. But, I mean, that that's an entire kit right here. So if you want to do Civil War, then uh – -huh. Your best bet is to get a 62 or a, 50, a 62 Springfield 
or a 53 infield. Get your bayonet, build yourself an infantry impression because you can go anywhere you want to go. You can fall in with any unit you want to fall into. And unless you've got a horse, dismounted cavalry is always and probably still is as kind of like the bastards of reenacting. It's like if you want to be cavalry, get a horse. But you set yourself up as an infantry impression and you can go anywhere and do whatever you want to do. Okay, dude. Uh, hey, we have the doggies. Uh, well, the question was like after the Civil War, like you, you were in the uh, Union Army, you got let go because they didn't need as many people. Uh, what would you, you know, carry around and stuff like that? And then, you know, you've lived up to the Indian engine fighting. Well, that sharps, you've got a prime example of one weapon percussion yeah. sharps. The Spencer, the Smith carbine, any of the weapons issued in the Civil War would have been surplus and dirt cheap. Yeah, and then uh, uh, for and if, you, and if you want cartridge guns, and you're pretty much limited to like a Spencer, a Henry, or the 66 Yellow Boy. Yeah, uh, and a 66 Yellow Boy will take you all the way up through the turn of the century. Uh, you can get for revolvers. You can get the cartridge. Uh, these cabin cabin balls for. A lot cheaper. Uh, some people will get mad at you if you get a Pieta because they, you know, they use their side as a freaking billboard uh, while it's showing up. Kind of. Yeah, they use their the sides. You birdie. I have a feeling you birdies are made more for reenactors because they, you know, they put all that stuff right there. Uh. So I have a film, but. And if you're going by the 25 yard rule, all that doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, y'all can't even tell, see it from me. I can't even see it on my camera from here. I mean, I'm not even a foot away. And I mean, it wouldn't be that hard to, you just de blue it. Take, you know, a little, little sanding. Uh, it'd be gone. And then you can just re blue it. it it's to where it, uh, you can even historically re blue it or defarbing, I think it's called. Uh, and there you go. You got you, and you've got, I think I paid close to 300 for this one. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I can't remember. No, it was 300 for that one new. This one was you. This is the used one that works fl flawlessly that I got from you. I can't remember how much I paid for it. Uh, but it, you know, it wouldn't be that hard to defarb that thing. I mean, Dremel tool and you just re -blo you de-blow it. Dremel tool with a sander bit with the right type of uh, sand sander head. Then re -blow it. Put it back together after everything's done. It, then there you, you know, there it is. And then if you want to do like a civilian impression, instead of the military, if you want to do a civilian impression, what you do is you get this book and then you contact me and see what holster you want me to make for you. <laughs> yeah. But seriously, if, you, if you're interested in what civilians they carry or military holsters, um, this book is a wealth of knowledge. There's all kinds of cool stuff in here. They got yeah, wild yeah. box holster. They've got, they got a holster in here that's silk embroidered. Um, they got one that's got George Washington carved into the front of it. So if you can think of it, you could probably get it made. Uh, yeah, I've been meaning to ask you, what kind of liner do you use for your holsters? I don't line them usually. Uh, oh, I, uh, we brought up the guns. Here they come. I usually don't line. I, I'm going to try to start lining mine in the future, but the reason I don't line them is because when you line them, you got to stitch everything. You got to stitch every edge. And things I do all hand stitching, I don't have a machine. I don't want to sit there and have to stitch around every single piece of that holster for, you know, it would take me three times longer to make one. 
uh, than, than what I make them now. Uh, so I just do the traditional style and I leave them on line. Now, there were ones that were lined back in the day, yes, but uh, um, if somebody doesn't ask for lining, I'm not going to do it. Okay, Pat said about 260 for most Pietas. Yeah, and then you got chipping and all that stuff. So, you know, they're closer to three ish, but, you know. <laughs> Good. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, when a lot of conf the Confederates came home, they just, when they heard the war was over, they just took whatever they had and left. So they had a Remington, they had a Remington. They had a uh, Colt, they took a Colt home. And they used that for the thing blew up. The thing is, if you're not portraying cavalry, you shouldn't have a handgun. Well, uh, mine, Grant, uh, great uh, times, God knows how many, Grandfather was in the on the Confederate side. He got one off of a Confederate uh, cavalry unit, and he carried it. I'm just saying, as a general rule of thumb, if you're not cavalry, you should not have um, a revolver sidearm, unless you're an officer. Yeah, that is true. But, uh, and boots right and but you got to look at this way if you are regular federal infantry you're not going to have handgun no your state militia state raised infantry state raised unit you know a lot of guys had uh, all types of civilian handguns that they carried with them and they weren't issued but they had them and uh what I said earlier, if you put together an, a regular federal infantry impression, then you can go to any event. You can go to Gettysburg. You can go to all the big major battles. You can fall in and you can go in with somebody somewhere, any place you want to go. If you get into the state units, you know, 4th Illinois Cavalry, hey, I'm going to be the guy with bare feet and spurs wearing civilian pants and a sack coat. Riding a mule, you're probably not going to get into getting you know, yeah. you do some golf. The handguns are fun. If, if your group that you wind up with does a lot of uh, like gunfight scenarios for festivals, then yeah, you can get you a couple of handguns. And, uh, you know, it's really how much money you want to spend on it. But if, yeah. you, if you get the basics, then you can always add to it later. Yeah. Uh, see, from my my impression right now, I'm doing my great grandfather, right? By times whatever. So it since I have the family doc, you know, documents to back up everything, I'm able to. I have a little bit more leeway with what I'm doing, because I have these documents. I have these photos of him carrying this these pistols. The sharps rifle, even though he was infantry, you know, uh, and all you know, all this stuff, and he was Confederate, so I'm able to do, you know, even though it wasn't normal for uh, Confederate infantry to have pistols and a sharp rifle, he did, and since he's my, I'm portray trying to portray him. You know, it's I'm able to get a little bit of leeway because I'm portraying that single person, not that whole unit. You picked an impression. Yeah. Yeah. And that's and, my point. You can get with a unit. The unit's going to tell you what they require you to have, what they want you to have, and they tell you what you can't have. But that doesn't mean that you can't have it. You just can't have it when you go play with them. Yeah. Uh, Mama Murphy asked a good question. I don't know if y'all can see the side chat or not, so I'll just show it. Here. Oh, it's covering up Don. Sorry. 
says, how often did soldiers use guns from the other side during the Civil War? Well, uh, part, they had the same guns. I mean, the Union typically had the 62 Springfield, and the Confederates typically had the 53 Enfield. But when we, you got 10,000 rifles laying out on the battlefield surrounded with, by dead bodies, you're going to pick them up and you're going to use what you've got. Somewhere around here, I've got a, uh, the ordnance manual, and it talked about for a Confederate unit. If they had 600 rifles, they were supposed to have X number of spare barrels to replace it because barrels become bent, damaged. You know, a guy gets panic and he's got 12 rounds down the uh, barrel. He sets it off. He splinters the barrel up into 15 pieces. They got to have extra barrels. But if you go back to what I said, you can get the 62 Springfield but you'll see guys patting them on the ground because a lot of times the powder doesn't get up in next to where the, uh, the flash hole is. It's just an inherent design flaw of that reproduction rifle. And a lot of times we'll get the 53 infield and they will strip the bluing off of it. And they'll polish it out and they'll shine it up and it'll make it look like a 62 Springfield. Remember, you're dealing with for reenacting regulations and rules for doing this in front of the public. You have a 25 yard impression. I stand 25 yards away or 25 feet away. I think it's 25 feet. 25 feet away, I can't read the Italian proof marks on your gun. I can't tell if you've got nylon stitching in your uniform. I can't tell if your pants have a zipper or if they button up. So you've got, you know, everybody used to wear East German jack boots. They were cheap. They're not right, but they were dirt cheap and everybody had them. Yeah. Some people wore speed load combat boots because they could get away with it at a different. A lot of units required you to have the brogans. Yeah. Uh Plowboy does bring up a good point. Not every cow, uh, cowman had a pistol. I think there was, uh, I can't remember what it was called or where they were stationed at, that had double barrel shotguns. Uh, Terry Texas Rangers raided the federal armories, and every single one of them got a hold of a 55 Springfield and sawed it down into a carbine. And they were notorious for carrying five and six pistols, double barrel sawed off shotguns and whatever they could get their hands on. Now, I think when they got to Virginia, they actually just took away their horses and made them dismounted cavalry and then turned them into infantry. And, but yeah. Uh, yeah, that, but yeah, that was true. And if you're playing, portraying that one, you would, you would have to, it just depends. You know that so much goes into reenacting history because, yeah, you can look at the three major rules: was it common? Was it this than that? But then you get into this oddball. So you get put into a, a Confederate Union uh, unit, a union unit. Their what they had was completely and totally different. To be made up of a whole bunch of guys with the infield and then that one, two, three, four, five, six people that have sport right, you know, hunting rifles that are flintlocks or 62 caliber muskets that they got from the state armory because that's all the state armory had to give them that because that's all they had or 62 calibers that were converted to uh, percussion cap to, uh, musket cap. Now, just go into it like this. Today's date, 2019. So whatever you buy, you're going to get 2019 reproduction equipment. And you're going to go find an impression, and you're going to make yourself look as close to 1860, 1861, whatever unit you got. That's what your goal is. But the group that you get into... Basically, you're going to find a local group. Hopefully, they're easy to get along with and they're not crazy and insane like some of the people I've seen them 23 years of doing cavalry. But anyways, you get with the local group and you say, hey, I want to get into reenacting. Do you have a list of required equipment? 
Now, the group I got into it with, they they were kind of control freaks. They wouldn't tell you how to look like regular federal infantry. They wanted you to look like ragtag cavalry because if it was a bigger event that you wanted to go to, you couldn't go to it because, well, you can't use that zoo off. You can't use this. Well, why didn't you tell me I can't use that? I wouldn't have bought it. Well, that got you by for our little event. Well, I don't want to get by for your little event. I want to get by for Gettysburg. I want to be one of the 25,000 infantry out there. So my advice from seeing this over a 20-year period, set yourself up as regular federal infantry. And the only thing you've got to have to be a Confederate is a gray jacket because you can wear the same old floppy black hat that you're wearing as a Yankee. Yeah, and two keppies, you can have two keppies. I'll agree with that to a point with that towards the later of the war, the Confederate would probably be better with a jean cloth. Um, I've got a Confederate Kepi that's late war, 1864. Um, I think it's 1864. The guy sold to me. Anyway, it's uh, he said jean cloth was a lot more common towards the end. Yeah, butternut was also another good one. Yeah. yeah. You know, that issue butternut. And, and, uh, if you want to, and if you want to be a minimalist to go play, and you are part of a federal unit, but you galvanize to be a Confederate because there's not enough Yankees at the event, all you're going to need to make everybody happy is a gray jacket. Or you can get a butternut a butternut, uh, butternut jacket. Yep. There's all kind of different impressions that you can do. But I'm, I'm going mainly for the minimalist. Uh, oh, wow. Like... Say you want to go to rendezvous and you want to be a part of that stuff, you'd have hopefully there's one nearby where you are at. Look, find out what you need to do there. And I think actually trying to portray a mountain man would be depending on the era, the time, um, might be a little bit more complex. A puppy dog, mine are all been bad today. I just some from the streaming room. Uh, because I'll, if not mistaken, a lot of them had, uh, carried flintlocks and flintlock rifles that are not cheap. Well, I got a flintlock musket. That's a thousand bucks. And if you want a decent flintlock rifle, I mean a decent one, not one of those cheap knockoffs. You're looking at twelve hundred to two thousand. Well, yeah, um, you're, you're looking at any. You're looking probably six fifty to eight hundred for a beat up used uh, Springfield or Enfield. Uh, what's that That's one? That, uh, you're looking probably a thousand, eleven, twelve hundred for a new for a new uh, Springfield. What's that one that I'm looking for? But I know they're not cheap. They ain't getting any cheaper. What's that um, one that Mark Hubs uses? Oh, I can't think of it. It's a Footlock. The Harper's Ferry pistol? No. Uh, not Mark Hubbs, uh Mark Hubbs Humphreys. That's the Petersoli. Petersoli. Oh. Yeah. He's got a couple Petersolis. He's got uh, the Kentucky. I had one of them, and I didn't like it. <clears throat> and he's got a uh, Northwest Trade Gun, which I guess they work really good. He's got a 69 caliber as well. I can't, uh, is that the Petersoli? I think that's the Petersoli. No, the Northwest Trade Gun is 62. It's a 20 gauge. Yeah. 20 gauge smoothbore flintlock. Yeah. That's and the one I was shooting the uh the water bottles with. Yeah. 62 is 20 gauge, 69 is 12 gauge, and my 75 is 11 gauge. Uh just in case you're interested. Force force. First Regiment poster mentions bringing shotguns from home at the time went on his command and changed them for rifles and carbines as well, Plowboy says. Um, Mama Murphy likes your dog. I'm not, uh, just for everyone notice, I know I'm waiting for those, we're get done talking about what we're talking about, then bringing it up. Uh, he says not cheap as well. 
Mama Murphy says, I would host a mountain roundup, but no mountains near pro our, our little property. I don't, I think they would find like a little valley area or forested area. I had a clearing in it and just hold those for uh, the rendezvous and stuff. They wouldn't actually be on the mountains because they would have to bring wagons and all that stuff in it. It would be down in a valley or something someplace, but normally people will uh, host it. Uh, is it Talking Bear? Talking Bear is a guy like Central United States that organizes a lot of rendezvous. You can get into some of the mountain man uh, groups, but uh, look up Talking Talking Bear and uh, let him know you got land, and he will tell everybody, and maybe it can get organized if that's what you want to do. Yeah, we'll we'll uh, we'll look into that, Mama, because uh, we might not be able, we might be able to do uh, a mountain man, but maybe a frontiersman rendezvous rendezvous because those are two different things. From what I've, from my understanding, I could be completely wrong, and that's why I wanted uh, two people that know a lot more about history, or two or three on here, because I don't want, I don't want any misunderstandings or people going around saying, "Oh, he said that," and I'm young, then I get jumped because I made a mistake. AMM guy, the American Mountain Men Association, they do rendezvous all over the country. I think they've got. I know they've got them down in Texas, and I know they do some in, um, up in Ohio and there, so I'm sure there's probably something going on in Arkansas, too. Just got to know where to look. Uh, they had the Civil War Gazette used to have a listing of all the reenactments, Civil War reenactments for the entire year, and I thought they had pretty much the same thing for the mountain man. I know I post a lot of the rendezvous and stuff in Cowboys. Yeah, I, I just haven't seen any. Uh, but there's a lot of difference between a Buckskinner rendezvous and your American Mountain Man rendezvous. Yeah. Oh, I a Buckskinner rendezvous, I mean, they make stuff. I, I From a historical standpoint, it's junk. Now, if you have fun doing it, I don't care. Um but put it this way, where I work at, we're very strict, and, and Buckskinners wouldn't be able to get in on that. Um, and then you've got, you know, the hardcore guys like Don was saying about, you know, you've got the hardcore re, uh, reenactor groups. You've got the hardcore mountain man guys where, you know, if you ain't wearing brain tan buckskin and you don't have a certain type of gear and made a certain way, you know, you ain't going to fly. Yeah. Uh and when you start getting into that brain tan buckskin making your clothes and sell that, that stuff gets spendy. I know a guy that's got seven hundred dollars just in a pair of pants. That's kind of why I always stress if you want to get into the hobby, be the minimalist. Yeah. Because if you go out and drop fifteen hundred dollars on a reenactor kit and then decide, hey, this is not for me, guess what? Somebody would be happy to give you three hundred dollars for the whole kit. Yeah. Because once you buy it, it's it's pretty much yours. That's why I tan my own brain, or I do my own deer skins. Brain tan my own. I ain't spending a whole lot of money. It's just wasted time. Uh, and that's why I'm working on this uh, leather. I'm working on because it. Uh, easier for me to work on, and I can practice on it. And if it messes, I mess it up. I'm not. I don't have to wait a year to go get some more, and then do the whole process all over again. And because I've got some, I can go get a whole bunch of skins from uh, my uncle. Because I ain't get to go hunting this year as much as I'd like to. I ain't well for deer anyway. I got maybe I got one this year. I was gonna say something, but if I'm not mistaken, a lot there wasn't. There's two or three mountains in Arkansas, and they're not really mountains. They're more like giant, small molehills or big yeah. giant. You got the Ozarks up there. Yeah, but that's 
to, more towards Missouri. I got a cousin that lives in Mountain Home, Arkansas. And they yeah. got Ozark. They're in Ozark area. Yeah, but like I said, that's like Mount uh, Mountain Homes near more near the Missouri border, though. It don't where I'm at. It don't come down at. There's not a lot of mountains where I'm at, so it'd be more plain. Probably be, uh, homesteaders, uh, frontiersmen. And probably would have been in my area. People that just the guys that wears the buckskin in the town, I mean, uh, frontiersmen and stuff like that, they would have probably been really early in Arkansas history before, probably before, during when it was controlled by France. So it. Uh, so I don't know if it would, if we could you could do that kind of thing here, but I don't know because the Ozark mountains, I don't know. You got to remember what I said earlier. It's still 2019. So if you have access to a park or a national forest or some private property and somebody saying, Hey, you can come set up over here. It doesn't matter if you're out in the desert, that's where you're going to go. Yeah. So. I'll, I'll try to find get a hold of this person and uh, see what if we can't run uh, get something together. Well, you got Doug Kidd from Border States Leatherworks up there in Springdale too, and Doug he does the authentic uh, reproduction cavalry equipment. He built my saddle and bridle and everything. Yeah, and uh, you know Doug knows pretty much everybody. So if you give him a call one time, he probably yeah. hook you up with some good people. Yeah, I need to get out. I, I've been meaning a lot's been going up here. So. So I, I've been meaning to get a hold of you so I can get a hold of that, get a, that number from them. Uh, Border States Leatherworks. Border State. Douglas Ray Kid. I post it on the trade blanket every now and then. Um. You give me 30 seconds since I brought the toys out. I'll answer that one old boy's question. If you're, um, if you're looking, the original question was, what kind of guns could I have if I wanted to portray a Civil War veteran and go up through the into the Indian War period? Yeah. Well, he had an 1860. Uh, yeah, there you go. One that I sanded down and I boiled vinegar and antique to finish that's got the two-piece r d howl conversion cylinder in it and i got two percussion cylinders for it this will get you all the way up into the 1900s i mean it's it's there it's it's gonna get you hey. and from a holster uh there's a guy where i worked at he didn't have he didn't have the money for a colt but he had the money for one of those and it looks almost exactly like uh, I was gonna pull out, dude. <laughs> holster it's hard to tell if it's uh a converted or a colt peacemaker from 25 yards away because they kind of look the same the handle grip the grips on them and the way it's designed so from 25 yards away, if you have to have a peacemaker, but you don't have one, they were the people I worked with. They were very generous and let that guy use a, his 1860 army in place of, because he would never have to pull it out. He was just walking around. I hate to say it, but not every working cowboy had the money for a brand new peacemaker. No. That's why 1872 open top is what I said would be another good one because they produced those up until the turn of the century. This is the Cimarron Remington factory 45 Colt conversion. So, I mean, this is straight out of the box. This is a firearm. You, you go to the right. store and buy this, it's just like buying a nine millimeter. Yep. It is a firearm and it's made to shoot any modern 45 Colt cartridge. 
Okay. That's the same okay. right here. Yeah, okay. Uh, so could you say that again? Because I missed it. Because I got kicked out for some reason. Basically, it has brought up the fact that not everybody had the money. Not every working cowboy had the money for a Colt Peacemaker. And these open tops, whether it was a converted gun or a 68, oh, there you go. A 68 to 72, uh, this is what was available, and this is what a lot of guys carried. And they carry these for a long, long time. They, uh, in the 18, early 1880s, you know, a single action army, I think, was going for right around 20 bucks a, a pop. And then the, these things would have been go, were going for like 12. Yeah. 24 and 12, I think, is what it's the these were half the price of the, or the 72 open tops were half the price of the, the single action army. So a lot of these were used for that purpose. And you got to look at it this way. When you were discharged and they gave you that, you you basically went out. They had a uh, the, the Springfield after the war. They uh, they surplus them out, and a lot of people would polish the. There's only three lands and grooves in it. They weren't very big. They would polish the lands and grooves out, and they would turn those into smoothbore shotguns. And they were like I don't know two three dollars a piece. Mm -hmm. as cheap of a gun as you could get. There were plenty of them because they had like. A half a million of them. And I mean, you can still find them at gun shows today, but if you basically had your smooth bore milled out musket, that was all you could get. And you got hit by an, uh, an Indian war party or common charros, and you walked up and that guy was packing whatever. Guess what you just got? Mm -hmm. Handgun. That's what you got. Well, uh, and if you're a dirt farmer and you never saw more than ten dollars at one time in your life, you didn't have fifteen dollars for a cold peacemaker. No, you might not even have nine dollars for an open top. You might not even have. I think these were the surplus. One of these were like maybe, if I remember correctly, six to eight bucks. They weren't as bad. They weren't expensive as the cold. Uh, yeah, that. At the end of the war, we was in a major depression, so that six or eight dollars. Yeah, that, that's some big money. That, if I'm not mistaken, that'd be closer to with the inflation all that stuff. Maybe closer to sixty. The six bucks would be closer to eighty bucks, and the eight dollars would be closer to about a hundred and something dollars. Yeah. So you know, even I'm well. This is just the cap and ball version. This this would have been expensive as well too. When you got home and you found out that the Southern Home Guard confiscated all your livestock and the Yankees burned out your house, you and your family were basically dragging a dragging a cart or dragging a couple of sticks on the ground with everything you own, walking to some place to start a new life because the carpetbaggers done took everything you had. Mm -hmm. you know, all you had was that old rusty bayonet and a 62 Springfield. Well, that's what you were walking with, and whatever you could acquire after that, it's just like today. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if y'all have to up or not, but. And y'all. Uh, so it sounded like someone was about to say something. I just. Uh, <laughs> allergies are kicking my butt. My eyes are watering, and. Well, I was just going to add that you got to think about what era or area, not era, what area you're going to be portraying in. Because if you're out there on the plains, the chances of you taking time to buy a colt or something, yeah, you're probably going to have one where you're going to be dealing with Indians. If you're a farmer back east, you might have a shotgun, maybe a rifle. Yeah. Maybe if you were, you know, if you were a good farmer, maybe one of both. So yeah. You, go, you know, and it's more of, you know, you don't have to worry about defending yourself so much as putting meat on the table. Yeah. The reason for a handgun is for personal defense, up and close and personal. Yeah. And I don't know if y'all uh, mentioned this or not, because I, like I said, I got cut off for some reason. It's, it's this computer. 
It has to be. I got to do something about it. I've upgraded and changed everything I could. But these cap and balls in a lot of states, you don't need an FFL. It, a lot of these can be shipped to your house. Uh, check your – before you order, though. Yeah, yeah. Check your local law. Well, like Midway, they, they have, like, the states that say, yes, you can, yes, you can, yes, you can, no, you can't, you know. It's pretty much the same thing. They won't ship it to you if you're in the wrong state. Yeah. If you live in New Jersey, Massachusetts, New York, California, Hawaii, Alaska, um, and Connecticut, and Hawaii, Alaska, the only reason for Alaska is because it has to be shipped ground. can't be shipped there. Um, yeah. They won't ship to you. Yeah. Uh, and these cartridge, these two-piece cartridge conversions, according to the paperwork I saw, it, when it was shipped to me, the ATF considers this a part, not it does not fully because it does not fully convert your gun. Right. So, so you're you not know. creating a firearm when you stick that in a gun. Now, mm -hmm. if you buy one of those cursed where they take a plate and they actually put a plate in there, and you have to cut the hammer down, and then you are creating a firearm, you can never sell that ever again. Yeah. yeah. Curses curse when you put this notch for the loading gate in it, that's going to make the firearm. And according to modify it to accept cartridges in a modern fashion. That, yep. that is the modification. Yeah, and even according to the person... Piece conversion like what Jerry just had up there. This yeah. gun is not a firearm, but this one is. Yeah, like I said, and, according, go ahead, Don. Think we're about to say the same thing. I mean, this I was just about to say it depends on what ATF form you look at, too, whether or not a black powder uh, cap and ball is a firearm or not. Yeah, what state you are. Look, now, do you what ATF? There's I've looked on there, there's three of them, three ATF forms that says they are not firearms, and there's three ATF forms that say they are firearms. Yeah, and the ATF will. If they catch you and they want to prosecute you, they'll use whatever forms they can to nail you for something. Yeah, and then, and according to the eight, I actually called them up and asked, said, "Okay, the loading lever on my cap and ball broke. I'm going to replace it, which I am eventually." I got one of the the conversion. I emailed them the pictures and everything, and says. If I keep this in here, is this considered a modern firearm? They said no, because you did not modify it. A part broke, and you're just using it the way you are. In the in an email, and I have that freaking email with their badge number and all that stuff. So they try to get me. Someone else is going down with me. I covered my own butt. All right in your state. Yeah, I'm all right my, for my state. But if I was to take this to a different state, the correct response is always check your local laws. Oh yeah. Yep. That is the correct answer and the correct question and the response. Yeah. Always double. And if you're not sure on something, call your local ATF. Yep. If, if I live in the state, my address is this. Can I order this through the mail and can I do this to it? No. Yeah. Yes or no? Yeah. Uh, so that's why I'm, I'm able, for my impression, I'm kind of able to use this uh, as my impression. Ah, Willie. Thank you for keeping it family friendly, Willie. But I hate to say it, we kind of, if, to prove a lot of people wrong about gun owners, we have to do things legally and abide by the law. Yep. So that eventually a lot of people i've had a lot of people say because they ask about it and i actually teach them about it they said oh so you haven't done anything illegal i'm like right and he says but i see where this last active shooter done 12 things illegal just in your state and your state is not as strict as the place that they were shot in i'm like That they did the sh mass shooting in. You, you see what I'm saying? I hate to bring that up, but it's sometimes things happen. 
I like that. And I just say a bad guy is always gonna get hit, gonna get hit a gun if he want can get anything he wants to if he wants to do something like that. But something like these, I don't dang I'll get to get my semi auto. Uh this helps keep good people from dying. And that's why I hate gun free zones. That they're too soft for targets. But anyway, let's get out of politics and get back to the talking about history. And I've noticed that in the western towns, they didn't have were they were a lot politer to people than they are nowadays. You know, there was a different type of mannerism. Like they actually had manner and sir, manners and stuff. I think that I mean, does anyone have like a any reference for what how they uh, react are supposed to talk or anything like that? The way they're supposed to act when they're portraying somebody like a soldier, a civilian, or something like that. Uh, uh Deadwood gets that Victorian speech in there pretty good, except for all the profanity. Yeah, that's kind of why I don't want. Well, and that's. Tombstone was pretty good, too, you know, with the crawfish and go heels. And if you look up some, we've actually posted some of the cowboy lingo. It's like 50 or 60 different sayings and phrases that, you know, uh, Kurt Russell, White Earp, you know, in the saloon. No reason to go heels over a tub like you. No reason to pull a gun over a guy, you know, like you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Carl, yeah. Well, you know, basically you're going to welch the deal. You're going to take the, you're going to make the bet and you're going to reap the benefits, but then you're going to you're going to back out on uh, your obligation to, the, to fulfill the agreement. Well, like, like how, well, well, I'm trying to, I guess I should rephrase my question. Like, what were, like, society norms for talking to people? You know, that that's like, when you're out in public, like, what are you expected to say when you pass uh, an upstanding citizen lady or something like that? You know, oh, right. Your hat, you know, you be allowed to talk to them. Open door, and it depends on the individual. I mean, you if you're in a rough cattle town, you know, you're out there to get drunk and party and knock the dust off your clothes and get a hot bath and have fun. If you're one of the town folks, you're probably not going to like. It. You know, it's that that that's kind of like saying, "Well, what are people like today?" Well, you got all tight. You know, two guys get into an argument. They pull out their guns, they shoot up the whole building, and a Chinaman gets killed in the process. Well, the sheriff basically arrests them both, takes them out to the end of the town, out of just outside of city limits, tells them the error of their ways, unloads their guns, hands them their guns back, and tells them to get out of town. Well, there's a dead Chinaman laying over here. They don't care about the Chinaman. They're not even they weren't even considered people. So, I mean, it's how you're going to act and how you're going to portray yourself. Well, you know, the, the signs of the times. Yeah. How would you portray yourself in 1960 at Woodstock? I mean. I don't know. I never went to Woodstock. Well, neither did I, but I'm just saying. I mean. I will even Kind of research the. You got to pick your character, and if you're one of these scruffy old minor types, and you know what? <laughs> you got very you got very little use for city people <laughs> and pilgrims. Basically, if you're going to get into any kind of reenacting, your greatest asset is not having the right clothes, not having the right gun. Your greatest asset is doing the research. Yeah, that's another thing I, I was going to ask about. What books would y'all recommend for people trying to get into – Reenacting any uh, book to the era that you're trying to portray. Uh, well, I know you Don brought up one because uh, you used to do Civil War and you do uh, Mountain Man, right? I'm live here. 
Have a little sit down with some friends. Awesome. All right. My loving son. Dang, dude. Hello. Man, you got some guns, dude. That's what's up, huh? <laughs> he's for sale if y'all want to buy him. <laughs> <laughs> nah, he's free. Yeah, he's free. Just take him and go. <laughs> Mr. Frost will catch you later. <laughs> uh, but uh, you said, Duke, you said you do mostly our uh, mountain men reenactment stuff. Yeah, and I'm also, I, that's what I did for a number of years. Now I'm starting to get to where I'm portraying a trader and a blacksmith. Um, but I'm working at a spot that's kind of focused on just one area. Um, along Santa Fe Trail, so I uh, read anything that pertains to that area, which is southeastern Colorado. Um, read everything I can uh, up on that. Uh, and read into the. You're not going to um, put it in one book. You're going you're to have to do a little bit of research and just different courses. Yeah, well, what, I don't know. Books, what books would y'all recommend as like for? Just that y'all have found a lot of stuff in for someone starting out. I know you said one that was the fighting quote. Uh, what was it again? I can't remember. Oh, it's it just one book that was published a long time ago. I, I don't even know if it's still in print or if it's or you can find it. But this has got a wealth of information. The uh, Old West series that's on Netflix right now, you can watch that. And that's got a lot of historical photos and a lot of... Uh, a lot of history in it and uh, you can look at some of the reproduction catalogs and newspapers and you know I mean you look at a lot of the westerns that they made in the 1950s they're supposed to be at post Civil War 1866 but they're all carrying cult peacemakers wearing clothing from the 1880s True. yeah or 75 Remingtons. I've noticed a lot of the movies, they got 75 Remingtons, too. Yeah. Uh, John, yeah, and the undefeated, when John Wayne took on the French Lancers and said, yeah. we're going to give them a chase to General Sherman's war, You did it. they did it with 1892 Winchesters. <laughs> uh, Plowboy says, co-ant, Antioch, for Confederate impression. I, can't, I think I said that right. Again, Company, uh, H. Company yeah. H of. Yeah. Jen, I'm going to have to cut it off for the night. I'm about to fall asleep. So I'll see you. I'm not going to be very much longer either, Duke. You have a good night. Yeah, yep. good night, Duke. Yeah, we're not going to be doing this much longer. Company H. Uh. Well, I'm, I'm going to give you an example. If you can blow me up. Yeah, hold on. There we go. Cherokee Mountain Scouts, Confederate States Army. He's got a sawed-off shotgun, horsehair bridle. I can't see the saddle. Basically, he's wearing all Indian-style civilian clothing and moccasins with a rope belt. And he's got a Confederate sack coat. Cherokee, Indian, Mountain Scout, Confederate States Cavalry. Now that is an example. If you wanted an impression, there is one impression. I'm not sure what kind of badge he's got on his hat. Uh, maybe something he scavenged off somebody because he needed a hat. Or it could have been a unit thing that they issued to everybody in that group. Yeah. You know, there are <coughs> lots of historical photos. Private, 56 colored infantry. He's basically wearing regular federal attire. If you look like that, you can go anywhere and do anything you want. If you're going to uh, 
I can't think of the word right now, but basically they, they don't have enough Confederates because there's too many Yankees. Uh, all you got to do is throw your Confederate sack coat on and you're a Confederate. Galvanize. Uh, While he's uh, looking for that, what kind of su what subject would y'all like to talk about next week? I was trying to have people that are oriented towards that. I mean, Don Gertz here is a wealth of knowledge. He's probably seen it, heard it, or been in discussion groups about it. So he's probably. I did it for 23 years. I mean, I, I, I've been to a lot of different reenactments of all sizes. I've talked to lots and lots of people, and, you know, I just – been around a while. Not George Gooding, but uh, like I said, just let me know some ideas y'all would like to talk about uh, next stream. So I've got a few myself, but I just don't know how well that would be appreciated. Oh, wait, doesn't the North South Skirmish Association, I think is what what it is, that uh, have like actual shooting competitions for like different uh, the muskets and stuff. Yeah, there's a live fire competition with them. Yeah, don't they have to? Don't you have to use uh, actual ammo that was uh, issued like the actual cartridges? Oh, you're gonna have to have some live ammo. For, I don't know. They I don't know how authentic you have to be. I've never been to one, but as long as it works in your gun, I mean, you're pretty much good to go. I mean, this is what I personally went by when I got into doing cavalry. I made a photocopy of this, and I did everything I could to make my impression exactly like this. <clears throat> you look up. I'm backwards here, so. Yeah. And below that, you can see that little square thing. That's the metal horse brush. And I found one just like that with a wood handle that at the feed store. But if you wanted to do cavalry, that's everything you need to be cavalry. And if you want to be Confederate cavalry, all you need is a different hat and a different coat. And one in it. And that's the yeah. carbine. And after you've been in it for a few years, uh, wouldn't it be a good idea to have maybe one of both? Like maybe you get a, you start out as being the union or a confederate, you get another. Well, the other what you got to do is get a different coat. Yeah, that way you can do both. Here's your confederate impression. Not a whole lot of difference. It's just a little bit more beat up. <laughs> Remember, this is not reproduction equipment. This is original artifacts. <laughs> yeah, and Plowboy does bring up a good point that in some places at some time that impression won't cover all all periods and all theaters. Yes, that is true. Yep, because basically you were Civil War cavalry all the way up into the Indian Wars. They were they were eating Civil War rations in 1868 and 69. <clears throat> yeah, but uh, I was kind of thinking maybe we talk about historical cartridges next live stream, like uh, what they were using, actually using, like for the military and then like different civilian loads. I was going to do some research on that so I could actually contribute more to the conversation. Well, here's one of my reloads. Yeah. That's a 45 Schofield case loaded with black powder. And it's got an 1862 Hill Johnson and Dow conical bullet on it. 
And the reason the pointy nose is knocked flat is because I ran it through my loop sizer to size it to 452. And then I pressed it down and I loaded it into the case with my press. Now I've got, remember that kit that I showed you, the lead? Yeah. The lead, if you size the bullet from the bottom, then you won't blunt the nose. And if I didn't want to blunt the nose with the reloading press, I could just put paper up in the top of my reloading die and it would conform around the cartridge without blunting. But basically, I mean, I can't make an 1866 cartridge because this is 2019. So this is a modern Schofield with a modern primer, but it's loaded out of a brass flask of black powder and it's using a heel conical bullet. So that's as close to a period cartridge that I, that's as close as I can make it. Well, I was talking, well, I'm, the way I was talking, oh, let me get you on the phone. There we go. What I was talking about was we kind of talked about what they actually, what the powder charge is and all that stuff was for like the military and then what the civilians got. And then, like, kind of like the different things, because uh, Plowboy says no, you can't use infield correct authentic cartridges in uh, North South Skirmish North South Skirmish Association. Goodness gracious, there's too many S's in that name. Uh, and here's one where I just uh, let me blow myself up if I can. There we go. Johnson and Dow, where I didn't do that. And this one's powder coated. And then here's one where I did do that. Only thing happened is I forgot to bump the seating die up a little better, a little higher to compensate for that. And it's still kind of round. It's just a little flat up top. And it's set different, deeper. But both of them are loaded on the exact same powder charge. Full bore military. And this one's a little crooked too. So that one's probably gonna shoot. That's gonna be a what the flyer probably. Yeah, um, I, I don't know what their uh, I don't know what their rules are for loading their ammunition and stuff. But I was talking about for like. In the Civil War, like talk about their their paper cartridges and stuff like that. You know, like, what was time? What which could someone see from like the sharps, the Smith carbine? You know, the sharps carbines, the um, Smith carbines and stuff like that. And I was hoping to get. Um, I'm trying to talk to Mark Hubs about see if he wouldn't come on and talk about it as well because. That's he's a wealth of knowledge as well, and I'd like not to misinform anybody. And I hope I hope everyone understands that. Night, Willie. I just saw your comment. You know, I, I would love to for him to come on. That way, everybody has that knowledge that comes and sees us. Every you know, Anybody has a question about it, they can ask it and he can answer it in real time. Well, they had, I think the Federal Ordnance Department had uh, 14 or 16 different cartridges in the inventory that they issued for different weapons and rifles. Now, your muskets were pretty much a standard thing. Your pistols, for the most part, were a standard thing. Uh, the book I got over here has actually got a box of paper cartridges in the original container. I make these little roll paper cartridges like my cheap version. I've got another version that I use uh, wooden blocks. But the bullet is pretty much... Uh, this is off a homemade mongrel. Mandrel, whatever you call it, Johnson and Dell. Once it was made, I just dipped it. If I can keep it in here, I just dipped it down into beeswax. That is pretty much an authentic cartridge for 1862, 
up until probably 1920 or 30 something, whenever they, you know, the old timers were still there carrying cap and ball. But, you know, you can always, the further back in time you go, the further into the future you can use it. Yeah. Once you get something out of the future, you can only go back as far as to the point where it actually existed. That is true. <clears throat> Uh, later, Pat and Plowboy, would you sometime uh, send me an email at that so I can get you on here? From because I would like to also have you on here talking about those uh, British infield cartridges. I know you've done a video on it, but I have some questions about it, and I'd like to have them answered live and everything. Because I would like to try to modify it so that I can shoot. Uh, and get your opinion on some, see how I could maybe modify it a little bit for the Manet, or M Manet, Mini, Mini, however you say it, projectile to work out of the sharps. Because the way I've done it, it tumbles. It'll shoot out the bore. It'll sh it will shoot. But it, about 75 yards, it tumbles. And it, and I just, one thing you, you got to remember is that that modern Taylor Sharp does not have the exact same rifling as the original Sharp's rifles. So yeah. that's where you're going to get into a big thing because you got to remember, you can make the bullet exactly the way they made it in 1862, but that Sharp carbine that they produced in 2014 doesn't have the same rifling as the sharps produced back in 1860 or 59. So okay. you have to cater to the modern Reaper. It's just like a Pieta doesn't have the same rifling as the Uberti. And I think the Uberti has a more closer rifling than the originals. Or I can't, I might be, I might be fibbing to you, but. I know Pieta likes to shoot conicals better than the Uberti, but the okay. Pieta has to be modified to shoot the conicals where the Uberti doesn't. That is true. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think uh, it, it's midnight where we're at. Uh, we can bring this up during the next live stream, so I think it will be about uh, shooting – I think I'll call it his shooting historical ammo out of modern guns. Uh, but I think we'll end it here. Because I think that would be a good topic to bring up because uh, I've noticed that shooting the uh, Johnson and Dow and all that stuff out of different reproductions and stuff, it they kind of throw weird things. And I think we can talk about that. I think we can talk that, about that for a good two hours and get different uh, responses and different stories and stuff like that. But anyway, guys, I hope you've enjoyed. I'll see you in the next one. All right, bud. You have a good night. You too. Night, everybody. Good night.